Hello and welcome to the Roundup here inside the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation located at 1801 North Lincoln Boulevard just steps away from the state capitol and uh, this beautiful building which is open you can come and visit uh, anytime but uh, this building is funded by hunting and fishing license permit and then we have a great announcement coming up here in a little bit as a benefit concert from a big time country music singer uh, will help benefit this uh, conservation here well, a little bit more on that but first let's get to our three legislators in Logan County County. They are Gary Mize, District 31, John Pfeiffer, District 38, and Chuck Hall of District 20. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Last time we were all together was for the 89er Day Parade, and what a fantastic day that was. It was a good day. Nice weather. It was such nice weather. I mean, compared to last year, <laughs> when we were just trenching in the rain, I mean, it was, this was beautiful. It was awesome to get through. I understand Perry has the a big deal the following week after we, that? Not the following week. No, we have the Cherokee Strip celebration, okay. which celebrates the Cherokee Strip land run, but that's in September. September, okay. Yes. So, so come on down and, and tape that show. Yeah, someone lied to me then. <laughs> so, well, legislator, we haven't met in about a month, but uh, last week was deadline week where the Senate hears the House bills and the House hears the Senate bills. Uh, some of the highlights to you guys of last week of what we saw. Gary, everybody started for started <laughs> once. Um, well, I would I would say you know I feel like the session as a whole has been a good one. Um, there hasn't been too too many disagreements yet. We're, there's still time, um, but you know working out the negotiations on the budget, schools, teacher pay, um, you know all of those things. I, I I think that we're in a good spot to to move the state forward. We're kind of getting those specifics a little bit, but yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, you know, there's uh, with the deadline being what it was, you saw a lot of uh, companion bills uh, matching up with each other, uh, and so uh, at least for where I was over in the Senate, uh, these were a lot of measures and, and legislation that we had seen before that, that started in the Senate. Uh, these are all bills, of course, that that, uh, that started in the House, and uh, they kind of match up and. Uh, for those that uh, you know match up a little too closely, we'll, we'll yeah. see them head to conference soon, uh, and we'll work out uh, you know some of the details, see some of the changes uh, that have been made, amendments in the other house, and we'll bring those together through some sort of conference committee. What a difference a year makes! It, it, it's amazing <laughs> what a difference a year makes. Uh, everybody still. Uh, it's April, everybody's starting to get on each other's nerves because we've been in this building together for way too long, uh, but, but still still cordial, still working together, still compromising, still moving the state forward. Um, I think the Senate, uh, the Senate sent the House about 410 bills, Senate bills over. Uh, we got through about two-thirds of those. Uh, the House sent 390 roughly over to the Senate and, and about the same numbers. Uh, so we really have been able to keep the keep the trains running on time. Uh, everything's everything's may, making it through. Well, there's many things uh, toward the end here as we get to the stretch, but uh, the, the top ones you kind of hear a little bit is criminal reform and education uh, with uh, uh, with uh, the teacher pay and the, a bunch of the stuff. Kind of what some log roll, you know, kind of type deal. There's different bills out there. Where are we at on education? I'll let you go first, Chuck. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I appreciate that. So, uh, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> As I'm flanked by my two house members, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, education, education funding. Uh, so, it, it's no secret uh, that uh, that the house uh, sent us over a, a $1,200 uh, teacher pay teacher pay raise. Uh, Senate leadership uh, and our Senate caucus is, uh, would like to see a, as much as possible go directly into the formula. Uh, it's our plan or our, our thought that uh, that uh, the more local control that we can give, uh, you know, the, the the better off we'd be. Uh, I think in talking uh, and sitting in on our caucus, uh, when we go home and we're talking to superintendents and we're talking to teachers uh, in town hall sessions and uh, eggs and issues uh, uh, talks, mm -hmm. um, you know, they just really getting those class sizes down uh, seems to be you know seems to be important. I know that, and I'll let the house members talk about it. I know the twelve hundred dollar teacher pay raise was something that was important to the house. Uh, we're really kind of getting into a period that that I'm looking forward to. I mean, this is budget time, mm -hmm. uh, and you're going to see a lot of things tied to the budget negotiations. Uh, certainly, a $1,200 teacher pay raise is a big ticket item, uh, and so. I, it, but it's my understanding that we're that we're close. Uh, that the actual number that uh, that both the House and the Senate are planning on putting forward towards education 
uh, is, 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 is almost there. I mean, we're, we're, we're just there. It's just a matter of, of how it's going to be spent, uh, whether it be directly into a teacher pay raise or, or more or less into the formula. And John, you're on the Appropriation Budgets uh, Committee there. Mm -hmm. Where's the hang up? The, 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 we know Governor Stitt wants it, and he wants the top 10 education. The House sent over 1,200. Where? It sounds like, and all the teachers want it, and the momentum's for it all there. Where's the delay? Where's the hang up? I, I, I do think it's just a, a minor disagreement um, because the total budget number uh, for what we want to put into education, I think the House and the Senate can both agree on. It, it's, it's how we actually spend some of those dollars. Um, the governor and the house want to give a $1,200 teacher pay raise. Uh, the Senate wants to take all that money and put it directly into the funding formula. Um, both, bo both plans really do make a lot of sense. A and it just really kind of depends a matter of weighing out the differences uh, right now where we can kind of reach a compromise. I do want to point out that $1,200 $1, $1 teacher pay raise, which is roughly $70 million, is not all the additional money we're going to put into the funding formula. Right. And I think that's something that has kind of got a little confusing. It's okay, you get a teacher pay raise or you get money into the funding formula, and that's just simply not true. On, the, on one of the deals on the teacher pay raise that I think sometimes that, that we overlook, um, we, we gave a $6,000 teacher pay raise last year on average. An additional, one of the, one of the benefits uh, besides doing something that we should have done uh, years before uh, is that it kept veteran teachers in the classroom while they allowed that their raise to vest in their pension so they can get a better retirement plan. One of the things that I've talked to superintendents about, and, and they say the same thing that they're telling the Senate, we want money to put, in, put it directly into the classroom, and, and, and I get that. But we have a teacher shortage, and nobody can deny that. And, and we lose a handful to Texas and, and surrounding states. Uh, the vast majority of teachers we lose are to retirement. And if we give a $1,200 teacher pay raise, and it backs them up another year, so they stay in the classroom, veteran teachers stay in the classroom another year, and buys us another year to try to get more teachers into the pipeline that we have to replace them with, I think that's money well spent. And, and, and I get the addressing classroom size and, and things like that, but if you don't have the workforce available um, to, to decrease classroom size, uh, then, then it's kind of a moot point. And, and so it, it, it's really a cordial conversation, and it's more just a the money we have that we're putting into education, where's our best use and what's going to best serve the students of the state of Oklahoma at this point? And <clears throat> Gary, I'll let you put your two cents on that as well. But without knowing, without diving into the jargon that you guys get into, but when I hear formula, I feel like it just kind of gets lost and it's <laughs> going to, I, no one knows percentage, superintendents lose sleep over formula. It sounds like going directly to teachers, so, or to teachers, sounds like a good idea, but maybe the formula works, but it just sounds like it kind of gets lost maybe? Well, the, the, well. Formula could, <laughs> the formula could be argued as, as a black hole. Yeah. Uh, if you've ever sat through any, yeah. of, any discussion about it, 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 it's pretty complex. But yeah. I, don't, I, don't think it, I don't think that at all, that if you put money in the formula, it gets lost. Yeah. Um, I think ultimately what's important to remember or realize is that in both chambers, there is an interest in moving public education forward, funding the classrooms, uh, making sure that we're paying teachers an appropriate or competitive amount. There, there are a number of members that care about public education. I would argue that probably all of them, but I don't want to speak for, for everybody. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, they, they spoke about a couple of different issues in regards to education, what we're trying to do, but there's 149 people in there that have a say so that have been elected to office and so you know I don't know how it is at your house but my wife and I don't agree on everything so getting a hundred and almost 50 people to agree it's it's not going to happen but I believe that there will be a positive outcome there will be more money for public education and some reforms tied to that as well. Now, are these discussions is this something like the leadership talks like in February March because when it gets to April May this is going to happen or because we've seen uh, both both houses, t both sides talk about, and then the governor signed it th within an hour. Is that something that just just simply can't happen because of the amount of dollars, you know, the difference in opinion? No, I, well, in my opinion, I, I mean, it could happen faster. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be at you know at the last moment. Right. Uh, but these are, are uh, the, these kind of tough decisions are, are used in budget negotiations. Um, uh, you know, we, we've seen the uh, we've seen the five-day, four-day school week tied to the teacher, the twelve hundred dollar 
uh, you know, teacher pay raise, uh, which, you know, some question, uh, you know, whether those, those, those two uh, are germane to each other. Um, and so we, we would want to want to look in uh, look into that. Um, so I, what I would tell you is that, and your viewers are, are you know are smart uh, and they're involved in the process. Uh, we we need to hear from them. Uh, we need to hear from those teachers. We need to hear from those administrators. We need to know what's important to them. I think it'll go a long way when we're sitting down talking to our counterparts uh, of, of being able to match up what exactly we are hearing on, on, on uh, you know, on the, at, at the home and, and at these meetings. I think it'd be very helpful. And, and it's just leaps and bounds better where we were um, a month ago, a, a year and a month ago. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're in such a better place. I mean, yes, there's, there's gonna be differences of opinion on how to best help education which is an amazing place to be as somebody who's been in for a while when the conversations used to be, okay, how much, to, to balance a budget, what kind of cuts can we handle? What can we trim back? And we're actually in a part, it's, it's fun to disagree on how to best help and best serve the students. Yeah. And it's, it took a lot of hard work and a, and a lot of time to get to this point, but we're finally really moving the bar forward. And, and I think that's, and I mean, little disagreements on, okay, is, is classroom funding better, teacher funding better? I think what, what we don't want to lose is about a year ago where we were at, which was how are we going to keep our education system from cratering completely? And, and we made some tough decisions. Uh, we, move, we move the ball, and now we're in this position to where we can actually have honest discussions on what's best for education. And, and I think that's huge. And I want to get to the five-day school week thing here in a minute, but while we're talking about money and education, higher education, you know, there's talks about next year getting a, a, lot of a lot more money. Of course, they've had cuts over the last several years, but they're looking at for uh, some more dollars as well. Is higher education come before or after this talk, you think? Is, will the education money for schools happen before higher education? Well, I, it, I don't want to speak out of turn here, mm -hmm. uh, but this will be out of ignorance for sure because this is my <laughs> first go around. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I, I mean, the reality is that kind of that, that's kind of all a simultaneous package. Oops. I mean, that, okay. it's all presented together. There are different bills: the higher education right. and common education or public ed. But it'll all be at the at the same time or in the same time frame. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Higher ed is going to get their, you know, their, their some some growth. They're going to see some growth, you yeah. know, in their budget. Uh, what, one thing that I really like that we're going to see that mirrors up kind of um, kind of K through 12 and, and higher ed is the concurrent uh, concurrent enrollment uh, funding is going to be increased. So uh, the talks that I hear is that's going to be a hundred percent funded this year, which is going to be really really yeah. a great thing. Uh, for both uh, those uh, that are, you know, in, in the 12th grade planning on going to college and get some extra credit and working there, um, uh, enrolling early into, into college. I think it's wonderful. Common education, that was the word I was trying to think of. I couldn't come up with it in a second, but thank you. Uh, back to the uh, five-day school week, and uh, I saw you had a few things on uh, Oklahoma City Media that I read, uh, John, about uh, five-day school week. And uh, Talking about, we talked about this last time as well. Is there a four day school week, but you have to meet this, this, or this? But uh, kind of any happenings in the last month on five day school week? We, we passed uh, the, the bill the Senate sent over, uh, Senate Bill 441. Uh, passed, uh, we made some changes. Um, we, we made some, besides the teacher pay raise, we, we added to it. There was also some, uh, some more changes. Uh, we, we made it clear that the House and the Senate would have to approve the Department of Education rules, and we pass back uh, the enacting date uh, for local schools another year, uh, simply because it was going to take a year for the Department of Ed um, to, to clarify their rules. They wouldn't have, by the time we got around to approving them, the schools would already have set their calendar, and so by defect, everybody would be, be pushed to a 165 day, day calendar. I, I do think that throughout Throughout this whole process, it, it's gotten mischaracterized a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, it, it did originally start out in the Senate as a four-day, five-day school week bill. What all this bill did, Senate Bill 441, um, was was to put in place um, a a min if you're going to do 1,080 hours, you have to go to school at least a minimum of 165 days, which includes the two parent-teacher conference days and the five professional days. So you're looking at 158 instructional days. 
And, and a brief little bit of background, from 1975 until 2008, we had a 180-day school year uh, across the state, uh, which we did 180 days because 180 days is half a year. It's what most everybody does. In, in the 2008-2009 school year, we had a bad ice storm, and they switched and let people go to the 1,080-hour option. What they didn't think at the time is that we would eventually see schools that were going and cut down their instructional days to as little as like 138 days. Um, and, and so when, when we're looking at schools that are going less than two-thirds of a year, that, that becomes troubling. It becomes troubling for their, for their academic standings. It becomes troubling because a lot of times these schools are the place where these kids find stability, get meals, things like that. And so this would just put a minimum of 165 days, uh, uh, technically 180 or 58 days of instructional days. And so one of the schools in my district Crescent um, is, is on a four-day calendar. Uh, they would have to add, they, they would have to add some days. They would have to add one instructional day if this became law. Whereas I have other schools in my district which are five-day weeks uh, that are going that ha on, on like a 150-day calendar. So, so to say, well, it's four-day, five days, that, that's not necessarily true. I mean, it's just kind of a minimal number of instructional days. Roughly 200 schools are four-day school weeks. Mm -hmm. Well, it, I mean, represented here um, today, I mean, we have districts that are four days, we have districts that are five days, and you can slice that up several different ways. I think what's important to remember is, or realize, that that was in no way uh, a mandate to four or five. Um, but with anything, I mean, as an athlete, which we were back in the day. Washed up. Yep, washed up. Um, <laughs> Anytime you wanted to get better at something, you spent more time doing it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's not a mandate to spend more time on task, but it was, I think, just like everything else, uh, uh, a negotiation and saying, hey, based on you know, your school district and what's unique to your, you know, your folks, your kiddos, let's figure this out, let's put some framework and allow some flexibility uh, but ultimately we hear a lot it's it's about the kids well that's about the outcomes too and so we need to make sure that we're giving kids enough time either more days or more hours in the day or less you know whatever just give some flexibility and, and there was some major changes uh, making sure that we approved the rules making yeah. sure that they had time to adapt to it was a big change in between when the Senate saw it and when we saw it. When, when the Senate saw it uh, and, and we talked last time and, and Senator Hall brought up a great point he goes we don't know what these rules are going to be and they're going to have to do this calendar and so it's going to be interesting to see how that goes back to the Senate and things like that but it, there was some some big structural changes on, on the reform itself after it came over from the Senate that, that in my mind made it a little better and a little easier to vote for that it, as it was when it was presented on the Senate side made things a little more difficult. There's no doubt that there's probably some abuse going on with some of these schools, uh, and they're going a lot fewer days. And yeah. just like to Gary's point, Representative Mice's point, um, you know, uh, you know, the, the more that we can keep those kids in front of in, in front of the the teacher, the probably the, you know the better off we are. But for several of my schools in the district that are four day, it's about teacher retention, teacher retention, teacher retention. Uh, and this gives these teachers, uh, you know, an opportunity and frankly, you know, families and children an opportunity to, to do some things on a Friday or a Monday that they couldn't if they were in a, in a five day deal. And what I'm seeing is that, that many of our schools, the four that are in my Senate yeah. district, are seeing great success uh, from an educational outcome. Uh, in fact, I mean, we recognized, uh, you know, several on the floor just a couple of weeks ago, uh, of both four day schools. Yeah. Uh, that that uh, that got uh, you know uh, a statewide uh, statewide awards for for their quality of, of education. So um, it's something that can work in, in some instances. Just to and again to uh, to uh, represent Pfeiffer's uh, you know point. Um, outcomes are important. 
I mean, there's you know there, there's there's no doubt about it. I mean, we need to be working uh, for the you know for the benefit you know of the child. But there are there are situations, there are cases where it works very well, and uh, I still renew my uh, interest to maintain, uh, give these schools an opportunity to maintain their four day if they can prove a cost savings and they and they approve uh, and they can prove a uh, an educational standard that is staying up with everybody else. Representative, I know you have one thing, but what's is the Department of Education? Are they leaning toward anything? Are they just kind of yeah, so uh, they, they get, they're investing on both sides. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the State Department of Education very early on came out in you know in favor of uh, of this agenda item to uh, to go uh, you know to go with five day, uh, and they were the ones that you know said that we'll we'll sit down with superintendents, we'll sit down with teachers, we'll sit down with legislatures, and, and with the legislature, we'll write these rules and we'll promulgate them, and, and we'll make sure that everybody is you know on board. I I have been told. Uh, that several uh, teachers uh, from four, or several uh, superintendents from four-day school districts uh, have been invited to the table uh, to sit down and, and talk about uh, rules that uh, that they can live with, and they're looking forward to that. I think what I think it's important just to put a period at the end of that sentence. To if you look at the process, because you hear a lot outside of the building, but what happened in that and, and a couple of other bills that were you know uh, talked about quite a bit is to see that the process does work that there was negotiation that there was change whether it was taken up by the senate or the house it doesn't matter but that i think the chambers were working together we were willing to concede and make concession and negotiation to put what we felt like was you know the best package forward it's just a unique conversation because one fits perfect over here and one fits over here and you're trying to make a decision for hundreds of schools so it's a really tough deal uh, we'll see how that one okay so we talked teacher pay raise and we've talked five day school week and from Logan County we all know about the term I learned a few years ago log rolling uh, in fact it was passed on the floor and it's a law about log rolling and all that stuff so is that log rolling putting the, and, and why is a five day school week four day school week and teacher pay raise in the same bill no well no. in my <laughs> mind no um in and, and it becomes it becomes a little hard sometimes to judge what the courts are going to do. Um, in the Constitution, it clearly spells out the legislature cannot determine the constitutionality of something. That is a job reserved strictly for the Supreme Court. Um, point in case, both of these uh, dealt directly with education. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, former Senator, former Governor Warren put together a plan that included money for higher ed, career techs, um, common ed, with a tax increase, um, and about five other things. The Supreme Court ruled on it and ruled it was not log rolling, and that was the two cent tax plan that went on the ballot. It wasn't log rolling because it all pertained to education. And so we're, we're talking about two things that are even in the same title of law. Um, uh, adjusting the minimum salary schedule and, and the minimum number of days. If you can, if, if a tax increase, uh, which is in the tax code section, and an educational increase, uh, which is in the minimum salary schedules, and, and, and about four or five other things, because uh, career tech and higher ed are all in different sections of law, if all of that can be deemed an education package and not log rolling, I have a hard time seeing this, this which is all in the same title of law being deemed log rolling. Huh. It's it's uh, we had like on my on my notes here. I don't know if this is law, but I like it. Well, we're going to talk about five day school week, and then we're going to talk about teacher pay raise, and then we're going to put them two together. It just <laughs> you know, on my sheet of paper says that they don't go together, but maybe I just scribbled it before right. we got here too. So I would I would reiterate the sentiments of my colleagues. Of course you would. <laughs> of course you would. <laughs> Of course you were. So, you the can, can we, in the middle. So can we play point <laughs> counterpoint? That'd be all right. That'd be can good. We, That'd be good. I, you know, uh, hey, listen, I respect these guys, and, and listen, both of them uh, were, uh, were blessed to be uh, in leadership roles uh, over in the House, yep. and, and uh, man, you got to respect that. I mean, the way Logan County is represented uh, by, uh, by, by, by two guys that, uh, that are in leadership, um, is, is they, they should be you know, uh, very grateful. Uh, I'm not a big fan of, uh, of the two. Uh, you know, I don't think they should be mutually exclusive. Um, I just, uh, you know, I, I think that both of them ought to stand on their own merit. That's the way that I would have preferred it. Um, I, I think that you know that you, you know, we're kind of getting into the silly season. Uh, you know, I mean everything is uh, you know er, everything uh, is done and the cards are dealt and played. Uh, you know, with with some sort of end game. 
uh, you know, some sort of uh, end result that they're looking for, and they may not even be related to what we're actually after. I, yeah. I was telling Representative Myers before we uh, begin filming today, I, I just, uh, you know, there are times that it feels like high school, honestly. I yeah. mean, it really does. Uh, and I'm just, I'm way too old to be playing high school games. Uh, you know, I, I think we were all set up here uh, to do, uh, you know, to, to do the work of the people and to, and to get good legislation out that benefits, uh, you know, the citizens of Oklahoma and particularly those living in the district. Um, you know, hey, I, you know, I respect the process. Uh, I, you know, they're, you know, everybody's playing by the same rules. I, you know, I get that. Yeah. Uh, but I would just like to see them, you know, be be, be stripped out uh, and held out uh, on their own merits. Uh, that was the intention uh, going into it. Uh, we would take a look at, at teacher pay uh, when, if it came directly over to us. They should be taking a look at you know at uh, 441 when it when it goes over them and. Uh, you know, and then we work out work out the issues. But, but no disrespect to the, to the other, other opposite house. It's just uh, that's the way I look at it. Uh, that's the way I'd like for it to go. Maybe I'm naive. I mean, look, I'm a freshman, and I get it. And uh, these kind of things are played, and they've been played since the beginning of time. Yeah. Uh, and I'm willing to play the game. Yeah. Uh, I just don't have to like it. That's well said. Okay, let's let's move on real quick off the education real quick and criminal justice reform all good stuff. You hear that all the time, criminal justice, just kind of talk a little bit what that really is. And we, a lot of people hear it on TV, they read in paper, and I know it's a broad criminal justice reform, but just kind of your brief description of criminal justice reform. Well, you know, oddly enough, when you, when you come in to this setting, um, some of the advice that I was given was, was pick a lane, and, and there are many lanes to yes. choose from. Um, but this was one that appealed to me for, for whatever reason. Probably because I'm a really nice guy. There you go. <laughs> um, but I, li I liked a couple of things about it. I like the idea of giving someone a second chance, but being smart about doing so. Uh, the reunification of, of a family, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're allowing somebody back into society, but you know, let's reintegrate them back into society, give them a chance. Um, but uh, you know, from a from a private sector standpoint, and, and what I do. Um, in, in that arena, I like the potential for cost savings. I mean, we spend a lot of money to incarcerate people. Um, so with that said, I carried two priority bills um, as part of that task force, and there's, there's a couple of them. Uh, one deals with sentence enhancements, one deals with giving a clear definition to, to certain crimes. And, you know, I've I've heard of, I've heard from a lot of folks about that, um, and again, it's it's one big negotiation. Uh, I think the conflict that we see, at least my my assessment of it thus far, is you have a system set up to incarcerate um, that funds itself through fees and fines, and that seems to kind of fly in the face of. You know this idea of giving punishing someone, you know, and creating a system of accountability for you know the bad things that you've done. Uh, but have you paid your dues, and have we helped you to rehab whatever the issue was, whether that's addiction or or whatever? Um, and then do you have an opportunity to go and and send them more, so to speak? Um, so I like the idea. I think it's an area that we as a state have focused on for the last few years. There's been some strides made forward. You can see other uh, states in the region or even in the country have made strides there. And I think from a polling perspective, I think people are, are starting to ask for it. But again, just like education or the budget, it's something that you have to get every person or party involved in that in the room willing to talk about it and negotiate and look at hey, maybe we have not been doing this right in the past. And as an individual, that's hard to do. So as a collective body, certainly it's going to be hard to do. But you have to be willing to do that. And I think it's an area, if you look at you know, incarceration on an annual uh, uh, basis, it's over $20,000 to keep someone locked up. You know, those two bills that I ran, I think if you look at it, and if we, if we run them through, which you know, may or may not happen, um, it affects over 3,000 beds. 3,000 beds times over $20,000, that's for a healthy inmate. You, you know, yeah. you, it can go upwards of 50,000. That's a lot of money. Um, so can we save some money? Can we get it right? Can we get some folks back out with their family, um, reintegrate them back into society? 
make them taxpayers. So I, I completely agree. I mean, we I just think that we're lo we're locking up way too many uh, you know nonviolent offenders. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we just we need to have them back into the economy. Uh, you know, paying their taxes. Uh, the, you know, this seems to uh, have come with uh, with you know great bipartisan support. It's something we can all kind of get our arms around. Unlike Gary, uh, uh, you know, this isn't exactly my lane. Um, but it didn't stop me from dipping my toe in the waters of uh, criminal justice reform. Uh, I ran uh, I ran an issue, uh, a bill that uh, that dealt with uh, with um, uh, felons being able to, to to get professional licenses, certain professional licenses. Uh, I just have seen it many many times where uh, you know uh, we have poor recidivism or we have recidivism such as it is. You know, simply because uh, you know these these folks get out uh, and they they can't get a job. Yep. Uh, you know, and they've got sometimes you know they've got uh, they've got court costs and fines that they've got to yeah. pay for. Uh, they've got uh, you know uh, child care ch you know I issues. They they may or may have not have have lost their spouse uh, you know uh, through divorce, mm -hmm. uh, and they're trying to piece put their life back together and they need work. Uh, and so whatever we can do to, uh, to, to let them know that there is hope, uh, you know, that look, you do your time, uh, you made a mistake, uh, we, we're going to allow you to get back to work uh, so that you don't have to turn back to a life of crime, which would ultimately get you back in the system again, costing us, uh, costing the state of Oklahoma. Especially when you have the highest incarceration numbers around. Right. Yeah, um, and, and just doing that and, and how do we change the system without jeopardizing public safety. And, and I think that's, that's where the balance is kind of hard to strike. Um, because you're dealing with people on, on one side, uh, the law enforcement community, the district attorneys and stuff like that, who see the bad side of everything. Uh, my wife's an assistant district attorney and she never comes home and says, you know what, I saw something great today. Yeah. Uh, this person turned their <laughs> life around. They, they see, she sees the people that have offended time and time and time again. Uh, and, and, and so that, that, that shapes your mindset in a, in a certain way. So how do we address how do we address what is clearly a broken system uh, without jeopardizing uh, public safety? And, and trying to find that balance takes time. We, we've made some we've made some strides over the last two years. It's going to be a long term project. And and it's how we some of it's just going to be clearly defining terms and, and things like that. Domestic abuse is classified under Oklahoma statute as a nonviolent crime. Ask any spouse who's been battered. It's probably not the case. So may, it, it starts with, and, and they have through all through their working groups and stuff like that. Okay, maybe we need better definitions. Um, maybe we we don't need sentence enhancements for things that don't actually hurt anybody. I mean, it, it, and it's all part of that process. But trying to get buy-in uh, from both sides is is hard. It, I say this a lot. In Oklahoma, a lot of times we want things to get better, but we don't actually want to change anything. Mm -hmm. This is something we know we have to change. Change is hard. It's one of the hardest things in life. So getting people to buy in and say, okay, we, we have a problem is a huge first step. We've made that over the last two years. Okay, if we made these first steps, how do we continue to change and make things better? Again, it's tricky because you talk about domestic abuse. Someone goes to jail, that would be enough of a lesson right there. I'm out, hey, I'm never doing that. But then you have the repeat of finish. So right. where do you, where's the line? And that's right. what makes it so interesting. I yeah. think it's important to make sure that when you look at this, when you look at this or anything, I'm looking through the lens of the way in which I was raised in my life, in my worldview, and my perspective. And so as a Christian man, I think it's important to put yourself out there and be willing to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Yeah. You know, the reality is we probably were all raised very similarly and so we made mistakes, but we had a very different support system and a very different background. So your punishment and then your correction was all held up by that support system. Well, there are individuals that, you know, are, are incarcerated and are in this system that don't have that support system. So you, you're looking at it from a very different lens and it's the same thing. You have to consider all of those, but it goes back to when we were talking about education. You're not just talking about four day schools and teacher pay raise, you're talking about food insecurity. You're talking about that may be the only place that that child has yep. stability for the day. So there are a number of different pieces at work on each of these topics and you're trying to 
make concession and arrangement and negotiation come up with law that addresses all of it, throwing a blanket out there, and it's difficult to cover everybody up. Especially when you have to cast that vote because you, do you just put, put all the pros and cons, this one out does this one. I, mean, it, I, I imagine it's very tough. I mean, a lot of people in the public go, oh, they can you know, gripe about legislature. But I can imagine those are, are, are tough votes because you can see both sides of it. Now i got to make a decision in the middle of which one I think is the best route. Yeah, right. and you may be in the middle of really what your overall analysis process would be, but it's yeah. time to vote and you have to make a decision based on the merit of what you've seen or heard so far and most importantly what, what Representative Piper said, what's in the best interest of public safety right now? Can we come back and revisit this issue, but is, you know, is this in the best interest? Then you can have those situations where you personally think that the best way for the state to go is one way and your district you know, once you be completely <laughs> yeah. the yeah. other way. Exactly. Uh, I mean, that, that really, that really or your wife. makes it difficult. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's not going to make it difficult. Too. Makes it very difficult. Right. Be, yeah, imagine. So, okay, running short on time. So, the, anything gun wise, anything Medicaid wise, cost of living, <laughs> uh, you know, I, we, cost of living adjustment. We, you know, my, my friends, my firefighters were getting all excited. Yeah. About a month ago, and now they're kind of <clears throat> down a little bit. I think I, I'll, take the, I'll take the cost of living one here. That way you don't have to dive into that. <laughs> or um, Medicaid or ODOT. Yeah, or I can we talk, the, 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 yeah, the cost of living, <laughs> the cost of living adjustment um, that we passed. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you really could go either way with that. Yeah. Um, I had conversations. I put, I got to vote on it twice because it came through my committee, and I think I said that last last time. But from a fiduciary standpoint, you have to focus and pay attention to, you know, what did we do to shore those up? And we are in the position that we're in now because of some work that was done before uh, we got here and, and some that Representative Piper went through. Um, but also, it doesn't take into account the teacher pay raise that was given last year, potentially, you know, extra money this year. You've got a lot of folks that are getting ready to retire from the numbers that I look at that are female, and, and you know that messes with the actuarial numbers. You can get really nerdy there, but um, you have to go into it very lightly. And I get it. I understand cost of living is going up, and healthcare, and all that stuff. But you know maybe maybe we're going to address that too. Um, that's that's come up here recently. Who knows? So, yeah. Medicaid expansion. Uh, you know uh, we saw that uh, the initiative petition came out. Uh, they'll be collecting their signatures. I uh, don't know exactly how long it will take for them to get their signatures, but I suspect that they will get them. Uh, the question then becomes, you know, uh, will the uh, you know will the Oakland legislature be proactive or reactive? And and I think that we've seen the issues that can be created uh, as a result of 788. Uh, uh, that uh, you know when a question doesn't cover everything that needs to be covered, uh, and so we get to spend a year or two or three. Of uh, you know of fixing those issues uh, you know that were that were left out by the initiative petition. So um, you know I, I don't know what exactly uh, it will look like. Um, you know I can I can tell you that you know that uh, that we take. Uh, in fact, I, I heard our appropriations chair Roger Thompson giving a speech uh, the other day where he said you know we take millions and millions of dollars of federal money and and we pat ourselves on the back and we say how great we are and we put up monuments uh, to the wonderful things that we're doing. Then we have this issue. Uh, it's something that we're going to have to look at. Um, it's something that uh, all legislators are going to have to pay, you know, special attention to. I can tell you um, that I would like to see, uh, you know, see the legislature roll something out that we can all be amenable to, uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, doing it by initiative petition. So I think you'll see a lot of discussion about that. I don't know what will come of it this session. I know that there's some talk. Uh, that you know something uh, something may go through, but I'd like to see a real serious interim study. Uh, there's a lot of big money that are that's being placed uh, on this initiative petition uh, coming from all corners of, of the state of Oklahoma. Um, but uh, but I just think that the, you know, the legislature and working with our constituents really needs to sit down and figure out what the right approach is going forward. And, oh, you want to? Yeah, and and I I think it would be awful hard to, to see something happen on it this year. I mean, where we are out in the process. Uh, theoretically, we, if, if everybody could agree, we could roll out a JCAB bill. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. I think this is too big of an issue. I think it's got too many moving parts. Um, and, and you're also dealing with an executive branch uh, that hadn't been on the job that long. They're still, uh, still trying to wrap their heads around all of the departments they're supposed to oversee and what their financial situation is, uh, which is going to take a little bit of time. 
I, I do hope and, and think something could come out of it, up out of it next year, um, or even, and, and I know this is going to sound bad, but it, 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 it's not bad when used correctly. Um, if there was a compromise reached, if there was a deal that everybody could agree on, I, I think we could see a special session. Not not like the special sessions we've seen back to the special sessions of old, uh, where it's a four-day special session like what they did with workers' comp. Okay, here's the deal. This is everybody agreed. It's planned out. It's agreed to. Here's what we're doing. We're going to pass it. Senate's going to pass it. Governor's going to sign it. Everybody goes home in less than a week. I think that's a possibility. Um, I, I, what the likelihoods are on, on any, any of those, I don't know yet. It's going to kind of depend on a, a lot on where the executive branch is and, and where how fast they can get through the numbers at the health care authority and the health department, which, as we all know, don't necessarily have the greatest set of numbers to work through. Yeah. Um, and, and so that adds a, another degree of complexity onto an already very complex issue. Back-to-back -back extraordinary sessions. If, if it only lasted four days and we were able to fix okay. this problem yeah. and move the state forward, it would be fine. Um, it, if we do do it, 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 it and, and again, in, in terms of likely scenarios, special session is down there uh, only if we get, get a deal reached. And it would be uh, like when they did workers' comp, I think, four or five years ago, in total of four days and everybody goes home. Mitchell Governor Stent, uh, first 100 days, he just had that over uh, last week, I think it was. Uh, you guys housed the Senate committee with appointments with the executive, uh, and we're starting to see some of those appointments coming in. Has a uh, good feel so far with that? Yep, yeah, makes perfect sense yeah. to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know why we waited so long to do it. Uh, you know, I mean, the CEO ought to be able to, uh, you know, for the state of Oklahoma, yeah. uh, ought to be able to put uh, in the department heads and have the hiring and firing, uh, you know, authority. And of course, uh, you know, the legislature retained their right too to remove. Uh, so I think it's a win-win for everybody. I think you'll see the state uh, a lot better for uh, for what's happened mm -hmm. in this in this session. Yeah. Final thoughts here. We wrap it up here. You guys, we're taping this uh, end of April, first of May, or we we might be at a session a few days early, a few weeks early, days. Days probably. Days, yeah. Day, yeah. Okay. days, days probably over weeks. Yeah. Um, and and we've. Um, I think it'll. I don't think will be out. At one time, everybody was saying the 10th of May. Um, I think that's probably a little unlikely at this point. Uh, I think it's probably the week of the 17th. Um, you have to, yeah, the JCAB bills have to work their way through the process. Uh, then the House and Senate, and everybody has to pass them. And then you have to, what, what everybody kind of forgets is, is you can't pass a bill within the X many days, last days of session. So we have to be in there. We also have to be in, not, not that they would, just previous experience with a different governor, you, you have to be in long enough so if something happens and they don't sign it or they line item certain things, you have to be in to deal with that. I don't think that's going to happen this time. It's just, uh, you know, it's for the, same reason, for the same reason we wear seat belts. I don't plan on getting in an accident, but in, in case something bad happens, it's there. I'm a little bit more optimistic. Uh, we are so close on the budget. Yeah. I mean, we are just so close, uh, and that's really going to be the deciding factor uh, in my mind on on uh, on how long we'll remain in session. Uh, I, I agree with uh, John's numbers. Uh, you know, it seems like the week of the 17th is uh, seems to be uh, the what where everybody's looking to. They see that as the goal line, uh, but we are just so close uh, uh, on these numbers, uh, and uh, I just. You know, hopefully cooler heads will prevail uh, and we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll make some decisions that, uh, that'll, that'll get us out of there and uh, back to the district where we all want to be. Yes, absolutely. Well, we're here at the Oklahoma Wildlife uh, Conservation here on Lincoln, uh, not too far from the state capitol. And did you guys see the news today? There was news today? There was news <laughs> today. It was really the, the, the Tell folks us what here well, Blake Shelton's put on a special concert in Tishomingo at his, um, his bar down there, and he's going to headline it on Friday. He's going to be there May 24th, but on May 23rd, Luke Bryant's going to be headlining it there. And all that benefits, $250 per ticket, all that money is going to go to the wildlife conservation. It's a fundraiser for the conservation folks here. Oh, wow. Yeah, but I think we can yeah. top that, can't we? <laughs> Don't we have kind of a country uh, star coming into Guthrie we here in about a week? And I got a little bit yeah. of breaking news on that. If you yeah, know. tell me about yeah, it. Let's well, uh, let's let's interview you. Yeah, yeah, here we go. Yeah. Well, uh, of course, uh, the music never dies with uh, yeah. Larry Gatlin, Vince Gill, Byron Berline. Well, the troubadours 
Nice. The Turnpike Troubadours have oh, been perfect. confirmed nice. oh, good. for May 7th. Yeah, that's, that's the special time. guest that nobody wanted to talk that's about. That's exactly yeah. right. There was, a, there was a contract deal that, that they worked it out. And there's 83 balcony seats right now available. I think those are probably be gone by the time we say goodbye today. Yeah. So but where can we get those? Uh, you can get those. You can talk to the chamber, got through chamber. You can go on to Facebook. Music never dies. So It'll be a great event. Good, yeah. good, good music for it. good cause. But we'll uh, have several from the legislature there too. It's pretty yeah. nice. So congratulations, wildlife on That's a good gift. Blake Shelton, Luke Bryan. Absolutely. That's awesome. That's cool. Guys, always appreciate Gary Mize, Chuck Hall. Thank you. John Pfeiffer. Thanks appreciate you as always. That's been the roundup. Glad you joined us here. My name's Chris Evans. We'll talk to you next time.